Hi, I'm Reverend Paul Ashby, and I invite you to join us as we seek to follow the compassionate heart of Jesus in our world today. Hi, my name is Stacy Schulmerich. I'm the Director of Faith Formation to Children, Youth, and Families. Hi, I'm Susan. Hi, I'm Anthony. I'm Katie Scovel, and we are your music team. I'm Dan Thompson, Chair of the Worship Board. We're glad you're with us today. Though our building remains closed, the heart of our church is very much open. Please visit our website to learn more about RBCC and join us for a post-worship coffee hour. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Welcome to our community.
Today we continue the series on the Lord's Prayer, focusing on the idea of God's presence in heaven. Have you ever tasted something and said, wow, that was heavenly? Most often it's been dessert, right? When we sense the vastness of creation, when we look at the wonder of the night sky, I think that is a small glimpse of what we call heaven. Hindus speak of encountering bliss as a taste of heaven. For them, bliss is not something you see outside yourself. Bliss is a deep state of peace that happens through often years of meditation where you get a glimpse of what it would like to be in God's presence. So I ask you as we talk about a God who is in heaven, what if heaven is not a geographical place on a map of galaxies? What is heaven? Is a state of consciousness where we're united with God's presence. I've been to a local restaurant called Heavenly Fried Chicken. Actually has two locations. And it's good. But I think heaven is a place where we will taste the presence and the peace of God. Amen. Good morning, everybody. It's a beautiful Sunday. Happy Father's Day to those of you who are fathers out there or to those of you who parent. I hope that you experience love from those who love you today. It is bright and sunny and I'm not even gonna try and stop the rays coming through. We'll just keep them right there. But I wanted to start with an opening prayer today that starts with a quote from Barack Obama and it acknowledges Juneteenth, which was yesterday. And Barack Obama said, Juneteenth has never been a celebration of victory or an acceptance of the way things are. It's a celebration of progress. It's an affirmation that despite the most painful parts of our history, change is still possible. And there is still much more work to do. The work we as a community try to do we still need to do. And so I open today's worship service with a prayer written by the Black Catholic Ministry of the Archdiocese of Baltimore, and it's a prayer honoring Juneteenth. And it says, we pray today, O oh God, for change. Jesus, you reveal God through your wise words and loving deeds, and we encounter you still today in the faces of those whom society has pushed to the margins. God, guide us through the love that you revealed to establish the justice you proclaimed that all people might dwell in harmony and peace. United by the love that binds us to each other and to you, and most of all, God, change our routine worship and work into genuine encounters with you and our better selves so that our lives will be changed for the good of all lives. Amen.
everybody. For intergenerational time today, we continue with our series on the Lord's Prayer. And, you know, sometimes whether it be song lyrics or a poem or any type of thing we know from memory or that we hear other people say a lot, we sometimes like don't hear the words the right way. And that can be really common with children when they are listening to a congregation unite together and say the Lord's Prayer. And that struck me as we work on this second line today because I have heard many a child say, Our God, who's art in heaven? Our God, who's art in heaven? It makes it sound like God's art is in heaven. And that totally makes sense to me. So like, how would you draw heaven if you were asked to? What would it look like? Where would it be? Who would be there? Well, I decided I would draw heaven from my perspective. And so here it is. This is how I drew heaven. And if I were asked, where is heaven? Here's how I would respond. It's right here. The space in between you and I. Like, have you ever seen the phenomenon where the sun is setting and the moon is rising at the same time when you have a perfect, like, perfect angle to see the sun set and the moon rise all at one moment and you look one way and look the other? That's where I would say heaven is for me, is in this space in between, right there, the part that can be filled. Because if we're looking for heaven elsewhere, we are never going to find it. But if we know we can have heaven now and forever, then we can share in it together now and always. Because we can choose to fill this space here between the sun and the moon right here, right now, with goodness. Or we can fill our space with divisiveness and make a smaller and smaller heaven. We can choose to investigate its light or its darkness, choosing how heaven will be revealed between us. Heaven, the space in between to be filled with and make room for kindness and warmth and comfort and generosity and forgiveness. The people who we love and the people who love us all fill that space and it's to be for everyone and experienced by everyone all the time you see god is within us and around us now and forever and jesus wanted us i think to experience it heaven in the now as well as the after now so if we know that God is within and around us, then so must heaven be too. So where is heaven? Heaven is where God is. Heaven is who God is. Heaven is what God is. Heaven is how God is. Heaven is the space in between us. So do it well. For our God, whose art is heaven, indeed. In terms of joys and concerns, in joys for those who miss theater, and oh my goodness, Pam and I really miss theater. We were subscribers to the Fifth Avenue and Seattle Rep and often went to shows at the Armory. Oh my goodness, we miss theater. But for Pride Month, this coming week, there are four different theater shows on Zoom for free on this week that are all hosted by Bandit Theater. So if you're really missing theater as much as many of us are, check it out. Also, this was an amazing thing to share for this month. Gallup polls reported for the first time the majority of Republicans say that same-sex 
marriage should be legal. In 1996, only 27% of all Americans, Democrat, Republican, Independent, whatever, supported marriage equality. I was at the General Synod and voted in 2008 when the United Church of Christ voted to support marriage equality. Now today, here in 2021, now Gallup polls report 55% of Republicans and 83% of Democrats support marriage equality. That is a wonderful, wonderful, compassionate progress over the past 25 years. Peace, shalom, salam. In terms of concerns with global economies coming out of COVID, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration reported for the last week the highest and worst carbon dioxide level ever. We pray for the advancement of solar and wind power and other technologies to give Mother Nature a break and also to give a break to all living beings on this planet. Peace, shalom, salam. Let us enter into prayer together. Holy One, grant us the glimpses of grace. We need to grow our faith. We know that faith is a life journey and not a guarantee. A life journey and not a fire insurance policy. Plant experiences of beauty along our path that we may see a reflection of your divine spirit. Let us know the gift of the Holy Spirit that is light, awareness, and inner peace. Save us from the delusions of ego and egotism that would make us think that we are somehow the center of the universe. Remind us of our finite and limited self that depends on millions upon millions of others to provide food, water, electricity, medical care, housing, education, and all the technological instruments and toys we enjoy. Open our hearts with gratitude for our many neighbors who work to make our so-called normal life possible. We pray this with a sense of gratitude as we follow in the steps of Jesus' disciples who were taught to pray with the words, Holy God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Good morning, everybody. This is Jan Stewart Thomas. Here I am with Shirley Wright. I just wanted to see you. You can see your beautiful view comes the Edmunds Ferry. Shirley, there you are. What do you have to tell the folks this morning? Okay. I was born in Chicago, but when I was nine, my dad got a transfer. He worked for the telephone company. He had a transfer out to Seattle. And I was born in 1931, which Depression era. And so he was very lucky to get transferred to a better job. So I lived in Seattle and grew up and went to Lincoln High School and I went to the University of Washington and graduated. And then uh, we lived in, my husband and I lived in, uh, at Langley, Whidbey Island for a while. And then he got a, my husband was a teacher and he got a better offer so he went down to California. So we stayed in California for quite a while. And then uh, I moved back up to Seattle again and 
I believe I went to the yeah I went to the Congregational Church University Congregational Church. So when Jim and I married, I looked for a Congregational Church up in this area in Edmonds, and I found Richmond Beach. And the first time I walked in to the Richmond Beach Congregational Church, there was Bill and Donna. People who I had heard of a few times since then, but had met when we were in college. And so it was very nice. I felt quite welcomed right away. And <clears throat> I, I, my son, Terry, is a piano teacher and he had a recital at the Richmond Beach Church and for his students. And there he met Terry and they found out that they had both had the same music teacher. Now, how about that? <laughs> and when I first went to, to the church about 20 some years ago, uh, we trapped, we still cruised a lot. So I really didn't get to know very many people. And so lately it's been very, very nice to meet more and more people. I'm just sorry that we can't go to church now, but it shouldn't be too long before we can. I believe the church is very, very helpful uh, place. They help all kinds of people and the people are very grateful for it too. And so I donate to the church and I hope that you will too. And if you want to make a donation to the church, you can, there's a website, a text, and you could also mail in your donation. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley.
The sermon scripture for today is from 1 Kings chapter 19. It's the experience of Elijah who was looking for God's presence and found it, not where he expected. It reads as follows. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, What are you doing here in this cave? And Elijah answered, I have been very faithful and dedicated to the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, murdered your prophets with the sword. I alone are left, and they're seeking my life to take it away. And God said, Go out, stand on the mountain before the Lord. For the Lord is about to come and be present. Now there was a great wind, so strong it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks to pieces. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his robe and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave to listen. May the power of this word inspire us. I like the title of J.B. Phillips' classic book, Your God is Too Small. Now that seems to be a very profound truth. Ask people to describe God and generally they reduce God down to a human scale. Voltaire once declared, God created humans in God's image, and then humans returned the favor. Most definitions of God are human projections based on very human desires, fears, wants, and emotions. For example, on The Simpsons, God is an extra, extra large Father Time figure with a long white beard, long flowing white robes, and sandals. We find this similar image with Stephen Colbert's dialogue with God on the studio roof at the Ed Sullivan Theater in New York City. Such images sometimes sadly fostered by Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel, are a anthropomorphic projection. It was an interfaith dialogue with a Buddhist scholar in Thailand who asked me to describe God. 
pretty tough question. Describe God. My answer? Ask a scientist to describe what was before the Big Bang of creation. How can we talk about what we cannot fully grasp, control, or comprehend? It's why control freaks are so out of touch with reality. Most of life we can't control. Control is an illusion. It is in the hands of the transcendent. As close as I can come to a description of God would be an eternal energy which was before, within, and after what we call creation, what we call this universe. But even that is a bit of a human projection because I doubt that God has any sense of before or after or time in the way that we finite, impermanent beings have concepts of before and after and time. When we think about God, St. Francis perhaps had the best response to the question of how do you describe God. When he was asked, St. Francis shared, God is without beginning or ending, indescribable, ineffable, incomprehensible, unfathomable, glorious, exalted, sublime, most high. And then St. Francis adds, lovable, delightful. I love that. Don't you love that? That after all of the acknowledgement of our smallness and our finitude, he then says of God, lovable, delightful. No words can accurately grasp the reality that is beyond the earthly realm. Seriously, try to describe the perfect sunset to a person who never had sight. To try to describe something beyond your experience, the words would only be creating confusion and not offer much insight about the colors of the sunset. To say that God is in heaven is to point to a level of consciousness beyond our normal worldly realm of consciousness and understanding. Heaven is never, never given a physical address in the Bible. Heaven doesn't have a zip code for mail or email. Humans have yet to comprehend this universe. We look at this vast cosmos, and we don't understand black holes, the vast expansion of the galaxies. We don't comprehend the realm even of physical reality. Buddhists talk about the ultimate realm, the realm that we would call heaven. They use the word nirvana as a place of total peace, total grace, total harmony, because we are in oneness with the absolute. But nirvana is not a place that you go to. It is a level of consciousness beyond all self-centered and narcissistic thoughts. Think of heaven as a place where you cannot bring your personal garbage, your selfishness. There is no people and no energy to make molehills into mountains in heaven. It is a realm beyond neurotic hissy fits. Hindus Look at that place, that realm we call heaven, and see it as a place that is free of all desire, all fear, all hatred. And think of it this way. If we do not have this limited physical body, what physical desires would we have for food? We wouldn't need food. What desires would we need for shelter when we would not need shelter or medicine? 
our images of God are often too small. Consider the wonderful story of the foolish cosmonaut. The very first Soviet astronaut, cosmonaut, to orbit the Earth was Yuri Gagarin. And after coming back from his successful mission, he held a press conference and proclaimed, Comrades, I have circled far above the Earth, and I have discovered that there is no God in heaven. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, there, there, there's no God up there sitting on a cloud waving to cosmonauts. No. But once again, that shows the small ideas that I call the golden calf syndrome that makes God too small. The golden calf was a deity figure from Egypt. And when the Jewish people were afraid and they lost trust in Moses and they forgot the God who brought them out of slavery, what'd they do? With their neurotic fears and need for control, they created a God out of a mold with their own jewelry. Some would say the sin was to worship the golden calf. No, I believe the sin was fear and ignorance. They thought they could reduce the vastness of the Creator to something you can mold in your backyard. <laughs> Idolatry is missing the utter vastness of God. Most of the time, we get closest to this when we experience the vastness of nature. So one of the things I often urge people to do is an exercise. When you go for a walk, instead of listening to a podcast or calling someone on your phone, just listen as you walk to the most distant sounds. Birds, airplanes, cars, dogs barking, the wind, leaves rustling, a truck, crows doing their crowing, insects, the many, many sounds of life and extend that attention to the vastness of creation. And after a while, you realize that you're a part of it. You're within it. You are in a living system that has been created by God. You are not alone. You are not isolated. You are interconnected. Theologians, especially in the Catholic tradition, following St. Francis, point to beauty in nature as a glimpse of heaven. Beauty as a glimpse of God. So pay attention to what happens in places of awe and wonder. When you're in a place of awe and wonder, your words drop into silence. Your thoughts fade away. Your worries disappear into nothingness. You are here. But the self-centered thoughts are moved to the background. That is the power of beauty. You can't even remember the news of the day. So far, the closest I've been to the consciousness of heaven was on a trip to the Southwest in 1994 to see the first glimpse of the depth of canyon lands, to see the depth of the Grand Canyon, to see the shocking colors of Bryce Canyon. The beauty of nature points to the beauty of the Creator. That's why certain religions, certain religions like Shinto, and I would say the Sierra Club, kind of worship nature. But nature is a pointer, a pointer to that which is the source of creation itself. Beauty gives us a brief glimpse of heaven in this life. If you don't feel closer to God in nature, put away the electronic gadgets for a while. Those who practice serious in-depth meditation realize what the prophet Elijah experienced. God is not in 
the fierce wind. God is not in the earthquake that leaves us shaken. God is not in the fire that may leave us homeless. If you want to be aware of God, lift your consciousness to that place of simple awareness so that you hear. Do you notice what the Bible said? Hear the silence. God is ever near. It is we who are often far, far away. Amen. today is another version of the Lord's Prayer. This one is a Maori Polynesian Pacific Islander version of the Lord's Prayer from the New Zealand Prayer Book. And I chose this one because it really says a beautiful thing about where heaven is. Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, source of all that is and all that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God, in whom is heaven. 
The hallowing of your name may echo through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by all peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created things. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come to earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In the times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip that all that is evil, free us. For your reign is the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen.